السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. السلام ورحمة الله. الحمد لله. This is our. This is our third event. Oh no, fourth event of the term. Fourth Sheikh Hamshay. الحمد لله. We have Mr. Basim Salim with us today, involved in both career and deen, just like Azir said. And our topic today is actually career and deen. So let's start with beginnings. Tell us about your story, your story with your career, your story with Islamic studies. How did you start, especially being in Canada? Because you went to, I'll leave it at you to tell, you, tell us the story of your education and how the deen part of it also came to perspective. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa afdala salat wa rahmat taslim ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma la alma lana illa ma'alamtana inna kanta al-albun hakeem. Wa indahu mafatihu al-ghaybi la ya'lamuha illa hu rabbi ftahli al-haqqi wa antakhayi al-fatihin. Wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-albun al-azim. Alhamdulillah. I'm glad you asked this question because I think that a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be informed by my my background and the very interesting life decisions that I've made. Um, he was drilling me, asking me where I'm from and you know, where do you get your accent from and all sorts of things. And when I explain this to you, it'll all make sense, it'll all click in, you know, as to my background, who I am and, and where I come from. So I'll go to the very beginning here. Um, I was born in Saudi Arabia. Okay, so, so there's one part of, the, part of the question here. However, my parents are, uh, not Arab. <laughs> My dad is from India. My mom's from Pakistan. Uh, and I moved to uh, Canada, I don't know, when I was 10, approximately. So I did my schooling here. I went to elementary school here. I went to high school here in Markham. Uh, and then I went to university at York University. Um, and I studied uh, marketing there. So I did a BCom in business administration and I specialized in marketing. One of the interesting uh, things that happened at York University, and I'm very glad to see a lot of these faces here, uh, was not so much the career decision I made, but the, uh, the decision I made as to who I should hang out with. And I think that's probably one of the most important decisions you can make. So we asked the question of career versus theme. I think the bigger question is, who should you uh, spend your life with in terms of the company that you keep, right? Uh, and so one of the major decisions that I made while I was at York University and a friend pulled my ear and dragged me along was joining the MSA. Uh, and so that did two things for me. Actually, as soon as I joined the MSA, uh, it made things very clear for me as to what should I do with my life. Um, and it made it very clear to me that what, the only thing that makes sense in life is to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, really. Uh, and if you ask me, uh, there were two things in my mind, and I'm being very frank here. Actually, it's weird because I've actually never done this. Um, when I was in college, I, I, I got to a point where I was questioning a lot of the realities about myself. Like I said, even though I grew up in Saudi, by the time I went to elementary school here, high school here, I forgot 99% of everything I grew up with. The religiosity, the Islamic principles. I knew the rulings, you know, this is halal, this is haram, do this, don't do this. But most of it, I forgot, you know. You got into pop culture, you got into popular music, you got into movies, you got into friends that were, you know, uh, not believers, not Muslims, and even if they were Muslims, they weren't necessarily, you know, practicing as they should be. Uh, but when I joined the MSA, uh, I, it dawned upon two things for me. The first question was, how do I become good enough for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do I become good enough? Um, and for those of you who are into you know, personal development or psychology, one of the questions that haunts people is, am I good enough? Am I good enough for society? Am I good enough for my parents? Am I good enough for, uh, for my friends? The question I had for myself was, am I good enough for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, and then the second question I had was, uh, if I'm good enough for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, am I good enough to attain His pleasure and His love? Uh, and quite frankly, it was more, more of a question of, am I worthy of His love? And so that sparked an entire direction in my, not my career, but also in my life of, I need to know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need to learn how to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to know what he wants, what he doesn't want, right? Uh, what is going to make him happy? What is going to make him upset? How do I get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And so like all of you, you're sitting here in your MSA, and this is going to create a spark series of reactions. 
which means that you're here in Chai, what is it, Sheikh and Chai? You're at Sheikh and Chai today, tomorrow you're at this conference, and then you're at this halaqa, and then you're at this event, and then you're studying one-on-one -on -one with a particular Sheikh here, and then what happens to me, interestingly enough, is in my last term of university, uh, two things happen. I decide to, uh, so I, I started going to RAS, which you guys all, you know, hopefully familiar with. I go to RAS, I stop at a booth, and it says, study Arabic abroad, you know, uh, sign up for a free scholarship. And I said to myself, why not? Let me go ahead and fill out this form for the sake of it. I have no chances of winning. I have no chance of getting any of this. So I fill out this application, and I forget about it. And then that summer when I'm graduating, uh, I get a message on LinkedIn. Anybody, everybody on, anybody on LinkedIn? You guys on LinkedIn? Fantastic, stay on LinkedIn. I get a message from LinkedIn, someone saying, hey, by the way, we're interested in hiring you, but we're based out of Jordan. We're looking for a marketing manager for this Islamic clothing company that I have. And I'm like, what? That's strange. How does that work? So I said, okay, let's talk. So while I'm having this conversation with them, uh, what ends up happening is that the, the institution that was offering, offering a Arabic scholarship also happens to be based out of Jordan. And they say, guess what? You've won a scholarship for one term. I said, fantastic, this is amazing. And then they realize that the person who won first place pulls out. And they said, by the way, we're gonna bump up your scholarship and we're gonna give you a full scholarship to study. And I'm thinking to myself, so you're telling me I have a full-time job offer from Jordan and a full-time scholarship to study in Jordan Arabic. <laughs> so I said, my decision is made for me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, which is his other question is like, where is your dialect from? Why is your dialect Jordanian Palestinian? Is because what I ended up doing was 15 days after my graduation, I bought a one-way ticket to Jordan. I said, Ma Salama Canada, I'm leaving you and I'm going to study Arabic and I'm going to study the deen because that's what I've intended to do. And so I disappeared for 10 years. So I disappeared for 10 years. And so this is where in Jordan, alhamdulillah, I, and I still am, uh, became a student of knowledge, tried to learn something of Arabic, something of the Islamic sciences, learning something of the way of the Salihin, uh, learning those of what Islamic culture actually looks like, um, even though despite growing up in, in Saudi Arabia, I forgot most of it or realities of it. Um, and then I came back here. Um, and then when I came back here, once again, I. Uh, I continued my, uh, when I came back here, once again, I went back into my field in marketing. So right now, like I said, I, I teach at York University, I you know, just teach at Guelph Hul Humberg, I've taught at Seneca College, Conestoga as well, that's a curriculum work, and I'm also, once again, marketing you know, a professional, that's consulting there, training there, and so forth. Um, and then, like I said, involved here in the community. So that's that's been my, my interesting story uh, of, of being journey here, if you ask me, you know, how much of it was conscious and how much was it from, was it tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I would say all of it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but there were decisions that had to be made and you know, that's led me to be where I'm here today. Hopefully that answers the, the background. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, just a quick reminder, sisters, there's the QR code that you can scan to ask questions and we can start taking questions for brothers too. Uh, there's no questions, I'll ask my question. Yes. Alhamdulillah, uh, you told us about this sign up page to learn speak Arabic mm. and to all you also signed up to the marketing uh, company yeah. in Jordan. So when you have opportunities like this, Hamza, yeah. we're gonna all have like we've had a lot of co-op offers. We've applied to multiple yeah. companies. Hamza, yours was the halal. Right? Yeah. So what should we consider? How important is it to consider? Or what what should we consider before applying to jobs that are that have like that are in the gray area or that might be haram? Uh, how important is that? Yeah, I mean, I th the so I mean. Career choices is one of the most important choices that you will make in your life. Um, and the first and most important thing is, we want to step back a little bit here and at, realize ourselves that the fact that we're adult Muslims is that we have this concept which you've already heard of is the concept of taklif. We are what? Morally responsible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're not just morally responsible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to our obligation in terms of prayer, but to your surprise, we are responsible for what? Every single action that we do. That means what? It means the things that we do with our limbs, the things that we do with our tongue, the people that we interact with, how we interact with them. And obviously some of the ulama will also enter as well as 
uh, our states of being. So having things like arrogance, having love, having fear, whether it's towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or someone else, all of these things we're responsible for. So how important is it in terms of the career? The, the, the short answer is it's if very extremely important because think about it, how much time are you spending every single day, you know, 40 hour week, 50 hour week, 80 hour week, depending on the careers that you choose. And so once again, when you enter those jobs, who are you talking with, right? Uh, what are you talking about? Uh, the work that you're involved in. Does the work, work involve deception? Does the work involve you know, promoting things or talking about things that harm other Muslims uh, or even other, other people in general? Um, what are you looking at, right? Uh, does it allow you to fulfill your obligations? And if the answer is uh, no to most of those answers, chances are those are not careers that you should be pursuing, right? Chances are you should not be pursuing. So. Um, that is so. That's that's one of the most important cr criteria that you have to keep in mind when selecting selecting a career uh, or a co-op opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one other question uh, before we start the yeah, yeah. question: This career as a whole, as Muslims, yeah. uh, we tend to uh, become so we focus a lot on Islamic yeah. studies, which is very important, and then we Same. tend to forget uh, our real careers and forget to strive in our own Check, journey. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what can you say about that, and how, how should we like? Alhamdulillah, we have a very good opportunity being here at the University of Waterloo. Some of us are engineers here, so uh, we tend to neglect this and focus a lot on Islamic studies. How can we balance between the two? Yeah. So the question of uh, uh, balance is an important one. Uh, however, let's kind of go back to the thing that I just mentioned before. When we talk about responsibility here, uh, what we are responsible for is all of the areas of our life, right? So which means that if you're excelling in your deen and you are uh, failing in other areas of your life, guess what? You are not succeeding in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? You're not succeeding in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's a framework actually, it's interesting. Uh, and maybe, you know, if there's an opportunity, I, I teach this framework, which is every single one of us, we have multiple roles in our life. The first and most important role that we have in our life is that what? Is that we're slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the most important role. Which, mean, which, mean what? which means what? That there are certain things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making obligatory. Like what the salah. There's another role, there's other roles in our life that are also wajib and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us in. Like what? For example, all of you are sons and daughters. Which means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made certain things <coughs> obligatory on you. Like what? Like being kind to your parents. If you're not kind to your parents, but you are Shaykh al-Islam, guess what? You are failing in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also made you what? Students. Guess what? If you are failing in your courses, but you are Shaykh al-Alam, you are the Shaykh of the world, guess what? Doesn't matter. You are also failing in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we talk about career versus deen, there's no career versus deen. There's career and deen. And being a, a son and a daughter, being a brother, a sister, being a khatib, being a volunteer at MSA, being the president of the MSA, being a citizen of Canada, being a citizen of all two. All of those roles that you have in your life, right? All of those roles that you have in your life, there's an obligation and there's a responsibility put by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on you. And many of us are neg negligent of those, really. I want everyone to go home and ask yourself, what are the different roles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put me in? Okay, fine, I'm a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fine, I'm a son. I'm a brother, I'm a sister, but guess what? You're a student at University of Waterloo, I'm volunteering at the MSA, I'm a, I'm a neighbor, right? In my, in my resident, right? You all, your neighbors also have rights over you. And ask yourself, where do I, where am I in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all those roles, right? Am I in ihsan? Am I doing the best thing possible? Am I just doing the wajibat? I'm just meeting the minimum? Or am I doing something haram, which means I'm a volume? If you're in volume in even one area, you are feeling in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are sinful. That's what that means. This means you're going to go to the hellfire. I'm saying being sinful. So going back to career versus deen, if you're failing in your career, realize that there are certain obligations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has maybe made it wajib on you to seek a good career because of your rights and responsibilities. And so it's not a matter of balance. It's a matter of if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put you in a place, it has its rights and responsibilities, and if you're not fulfilling them, then you're doing ghulm on either yourself, the people that are dependent on you, or the people that you're working with, 
and you're being sinful in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is one thing that most people completely forget, completely forget. And so that, that's how I would answer that. I know it's a long answer, but without that perspective, all the other areas of your life, someone might say, okay, fine, deen and career is important, but my health, eh, it's okay, I could care less about it. Your health is also important as well. I have a question, kind yeah. of following up on that, yeah. um, we often hear this phrase like, deen over dunya, yeah. you know? Yeah. But I, I feel like that's kind of misleading because yeah. you're, you have to have deen in your dunya as well. Uh, and, and it can like dictate your, like everything you do in the dunya while striving for it. So is that correct? And how can we kind of use Islam in pursuits of the dunya? Yeah. So that goes back to, um, so when you go back to uh, the different roles that you have, okay? Uh, and what this is, the problem with um, categorizing things is that what ends up happening makes things vague. So there's no category called dunya. There's things in the dunya that you have to deal with. So for example, like if, you know, uh, me as an employee, that is my dunya. For someone else being the politician, that's also their dunya. For someone else being community leader, that's part of their dunya. So the question of, well, how do I make, or how do I lead that aspect of the dunya with my deen? Well, first of all, what is your intention for that aspect of the dunya? Because look, your body is dunya. It's material. If you say, no, no, my, 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 the fact that I go to the gym is not dunya. Well, it depends. Is it dunya or is it akhirah? Right? What did the Prophet wasallam he said? He said, everything in the dunya is mal'una mal'una ma fiha. Everything in the dunya is, uh, is cursed, right? And everything in it is cursed. Illa what? Except for what? Illa dhikrullahi azza wa jal wa ma wala. Except for that, except for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that which accompanies it, aw aliman aw muta'aliman, or the scholar or the one who's studying from it. Meaning what? Meaning that when you exercise for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's not dunya. That's deen. When you want to become you know, a top engineer at Google for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's not dunya, that's deen. When you want to say, you know what, I'm going to learn, uh, I'm going to run for, you know, a, a ward counselor for the city of Waterloo. If it's done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's deen, that's not dunya. So the question is, well, is that dunya or is that deen or is it deen over dunya? Well, the question is, what is your intention, right? And we know that the way that the niya works is, you are rewarded for an action bihasab ikhlas fi amal. So if you have 50% ikhlas, then you can say, well, that's 50% deen and it's also 50% dunya. But all of it is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're pure ikhlas in it, then all of it is akhirah. It is forever for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's, that's how I would look at it, is that, well, make everything deen through one's intention and through one's ikhlas. Uh, there's actually, speaking about this, there's yeah. a sister asking uh, that she has a lot of options that she wants to go mm. into, like medicine, pharmacy, and research. But she needs help to decide uh, about that because she also cannot yeah. balance between because she's going to have many duties when she gets married to yeah. such as taking care of her family yes. and taking care of her kids. She's asking for your advice on this. Yes. Uh, and that's, that's extremely important. Uh, and this actually question also applies for both uh, men and women. So this is not just like, you know, I'm a sister, I'm going to get married and so I'm going to have kids. And so, you know, a, a lot of my responsibilities are going to be... Uh, uh, occupied by by being busy in the household but this also equally applies to men and this is why the way so this is where planning comes into play and this is something that I that I preach a lot only because you know being a business professional you know you do business plans and marketing plans you know and I've been a huge junkie of you know uh, professional development and even personal development so I've, I've done a lot of these courses on planning but ask yourself 20 years from now 30 years from now when you get married, when you have kids, will you have, a, will you have a career that is going to allow you to give your wife or your husband their due? Will you have a career or a job that's going to give the children their due? If you have a vision for yourself that, you know what, honestly, I want to get involved in the community and a part of my life, I want to be involved no matter what. Will you have a job or career that's going to allow you to do that? If the answer is no, then what are you doing? Unless, unless the only exception I will make is the line of work that you're doing is so intertwined with possibly some of those things where you can make an ex exception there that you know what, well, I'm getting paid for this anyways, right? 
But otherwise, you have to ask yourself that question, right? You have to design your lifestyle while you are young, while you're still at the stage where you can make those decisions, right? If you know you're going to take a job, yeah, like for example, I had a friend, you know, he worked, uh, he's also a UW graduate. Um, he got a job at Deloitte. He quit after eight months. He couldn't do it. 80 hour weeks, traveling around the world, you know, missing prayers, right? Not being able to do dhikr properly, not being able to stay focused, not being able to attend Jum'ah regularly. Khalas, despite how great the salary was, what good is it when you are forfeiting some of your obligations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the same question you should ask yourself uh, when making some of those career, career decisions. Alhamdulillah. Uh, before I take questions from the brother, yeah. I have one very important question yeah. that I got from my sister. She's saying, uh, for career-wise, yeah. how do you make sure that your intentions in taking a job or like pursuing career or being successful in your career. How do you make sure that your intention is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or for any reason that goes by extension to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not greed or just chasing money and wealth for, for your personal reasons? Uh, your intention should be there. So you should, you, what I recommend actually everybody is to create your intentions for your careers right now before you have the career. Make your intention for zawaj, for marriage, before you even get married, even if it's five, ten years down the road. Make your intention for being a community leader, even if it's 30, 40, 50 years down the road now. And make it very specific as to what you intend to do with it, right? So, for example, if you ask yourself, well, how do I know if my career is sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Most people jump off the cliff and then ask themselves, well, how do I create a parachute now while I'm in the air, right? That's not how you do it. What you do is like, you know what? My intention is to have a job that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you go into specifics. I have a job that allows me to pray five times a day on time. My, I, I, <clears throat> my intention is to have a job where I am not, uh, you know, being sent to doubtful places or, you know, uh, where I don't have to interact with certain people or certain products or services or industries. Create that intention now. And so when it comes to applying for jobs, when it comes to interviewing, when it comes to getting in the job and navigating it, it makes it much more easier for you to be sincere because then you start seeing the fruits of your intention in that job, right? And then you start to feel the, well, I guess you could say, the sweetness of faith or the ikhlas as you're pursuing those things, right? Um, and then the other thing is what? Niyyah is, uh, is always renewed, right? You have to do tajdeed of your niyyah. If the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Jadidu imanukum bi qawli la ilaha illallah. If he said, renew your faith by saying la ilaha illallah, then what about niyyah? Then every time you go into a job, you say, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm here there, for example, to provide for my family, or to serve the ummah, or to whatever, whatever that intention could be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or to improve my skills so I can better serve the community later on. So that's how you kind of keep that intention alive. But it's a, it's a, daily, it's a daily exercise. It's not like, oh, I wrote my intention, intention book and khalas of it too. <laughs> you, you have to keep renewing it. Okay, we'll take questions from brothers. Any questions? And there's no questions from the sisters, so I'll go on. Uh, let's talk about giving back to the community once you attain a very good position or you're a yeah. high position where you can actually, where you have the possibility to give back to your community. Does it become more of a duty for you to give back to your community? Like, uh, just the example of you, alhamdulillah, yeah. mashallah, you're giving back to your community, you're here today helping your fellow students. The, the, like, the, the students that you, the students just like you once were, yeah. you were once a student. So, uh, what can you say about that? Yeah, so, as uh, so in the Sharia, we have this concept of uh, Fard Ayn and Fard Kifaya, which means that there's things that are personally obligatory on all of us. Like what? Like the salah, like the siyam, like zakah, like sadaqah, and all those things. Those are all obligatory. Then there's this concept of fard kifaya, which is that there are certain needs of the community. Okay, there's certain needs of the community that arise based on its growth. So, for example, there's so many Muslims here at the University of Waterloo. Guess what? There's a fard kifaya here to have Jum'ah. Can you go to a masjid nearby, to, to the Waterloo Masjid? Of course you can, right? But there's a fard kifaya now, there's a communal obligation now to actually have a Jum'ah here. There's a fard kifaya now to have some sort of a, um, I guess, an organization or polity to organize the affairs of the believers here. There's a fard kifaya now to organize so people can learn their deen, right? And so as you progress in your career or as you progress in your Islamic studies, realize that now you have skills 
And it could be anything. It could be engineering. It could be you know medicine. It could be pharmacy. It could be marketing, like I am, right? Where the Muslim community needs that direly, or that skill is going to amplify or accelerate the growth and the uh, benefit of the Muslim in the, in the polity that they're in, in the in the country that they're in. And so, guess what? That's communally obligatory on you. So you have to wake up to that. You can't say, oh, I don't want to do it. I want to be humble. I can't be bothered. I don't have time. You know, my career is more important. You have to give back to that. And kind of going back to this, this idea of how we should plan a career. So I have this framework in my head, um, which is the way you should plan your life is once again, is ask yourself at the end of the career, you want to maximize the benefit to your to the ummah as much as possible. So from the ages of, let's say, 40 to 60, or maybe 50, I guess you have 40, 40 to 60, or you can say 45 to 65, or, or, or and above, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us all long lives. That is the time for you to give back your ummah. That is the prime period. Okay, what about the 10, 15, 20 years before that? That is the time where you should be serving who? Your family. You should be serving your family. I, husband and wife should be loving each other, supporting one another, right? Working together as a team to do what? To be raising the next generation of what? <laughs> Believers. And guess what? Your kids, and I don't like using this word, they're your, uh, is, there, is there a better word for guinea pigs? <laughs> is there a better word for guinea pigs? Before you can go out and benefit the ummah and say, oh, I'm going to be Shaykh al-Islam and I'm going to be a khatib and I want to be this and that, work on your kids first. Because they're a prime example of what you're going to face in the world. Right? So your job for those 10, 20 years is to work on them. Now, for you to be able to work with your family and with your wife and with your kids, guess what? Do you have a career that allows you to do that? If your career is so busy where you're not giving your wife her due, you're not giving your husband your due, you're not giving your kids your due, then what good is that? And in order for you to have a career that allows you to do that, what are you doing in school today? If you have midterms, you guys should be here. But you should be studying, right? Study hard. It's only four years. Maybe it's eight, six years. Maybe it's eight years. But that's it. Right? That's it. The only the time for happiness and have fun was the time before that, when you were in high school, you know, in elementary school. That was the time to have fun and do whatever you want. Although I would argue otherwise, like I would have a different plan for my kids. But, but think about how, how we got to that point, right? So if you want to give back to the community when you're 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, then guess what? Have a good family life. If you want a good family life, then make good career choices. If you want to make good career choices, then make very smart educational choices. Do really well in school. It's only four years of hard work. That's it. Four, six, eight years, whatever it is. And then you can get to that point, right? But it requires planning. It requires thinking. It requires having intentions for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and just going day in and day out, you know, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, a question with um, working for people in like companies and stuff, uh, especially, you know, we have like a co-op program on campus, yeah. so a lot of us are already kind of doing internships and working and stuff. With companies, a lot of them may be involved in, or supporting ideologies that we don't support, like, you know, uh, yeah. LGBTQ stuff, or with all the stuff going on, you know, they may be, you know, partnering with Israeli institutions or other institutions that are supporting things that we don't want to. How kind of do we navigate that and how strict do we be with kind of like, do I say, okay, if they're, you know, they're doing business with a company there, I'm not working for them. Then, or if they, they support this ideology, I'm not working for them. That cuts off like, you know, 80, 90% of the potential opportunities you may have. So kind of how do, how do we navigate that? Yeah. This is a fatwa question. Uh, this is a fatwa question. So, uh, so let's see how the Sharia navigates this um, when it comes to pure halal haram. Okay, because the question you're actually asking is not a question of halal and haram. It's actually a question of wara. Wara literally means being strict, despite it even being permissible. Okay. So if we go to the halal and haram, let's take a pure haram example. Uh, and even this is questionable. So let's say you're working for a bank that purely makes 100% of its profit through riba, okay? Working for a bank, in that case, all right, would be considered uh, impermissible, right? And once again, I'm, I'm adding that qualification here. 
Um, however, the ulama have mentioned that if you have an institution like a bank that gets some percentage of their income from not from riba but from other things, administrative work, you know, maybe they have other products that they're selling which is not interest related, it is permissible to uh, work for them and what one intends or what one says is that the income that one is getting is coming from that portion, even though practically it may not be. However, to, however, if one is in a situation where that's the only job that you have, is that one uses that as a way. Some of the other scholars that it has to be 50%, some of them say even 1% or even a bit is permissible. So this is like more of a fatwa question here. As for a question of ideology, as for a question of you know 1% of their profits goes to this ideology or to this political group, um, this is a question of what ought now, and this is a question of opportunities. So if you're applying for co-ops, and there's only one company that's giving you, made you an offer, right? Do you say, nope, I'm not gonna take this offer, and I'm just gonna just put my career, uh, you know, uh, aspirations to rest? No, that's not what you do, right? You take that, but you make the intention that the next company I apply for, or the next opportunity I apply for is something that has less, if not none of the above, right? So if you've got multiple options, then you get the company that is the least involved in any of that. That's how one navigates it, right? I think it's, it's a complete uh, misunderstanding here, like, oh no, they support, you know, let's say LGBTQ, halas, I'm going to put my entire career to ruin, you know, because, you know, they change their social media uh, banners to rainbows now, and so halas, I'm, I'm not gonna work for that company. Forget it. Forget, I mean, I, for example, I work for universities. Universities are the most liberal places. <laughs> I wouldn't have a job today. I'd be begging today, <laughs> right? If, 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 you know, if I said to myself, halas, I can't, right? And, and you see the posters, you know, like LGBTQ party and this and that, and you know, we're celebrating Pride. Right? We see all those things, right? We see all those things, right? But one says, you know what, I'm here to do my job. You know, I'm not attending the, those things. I'm not promoting those things. I'm not talking about those things. I do what I need to do. Right? But as for the next career or as for how I navigate it, I do it in a way where I'm avoiding that as much as possible. Right? So this is not a halal haram issue. This is more of a water issue where how does one find the best opportunity where you find the least um, haram or I guess dubious or gray as much as possible in, in the companies that one works for. Yeah. Yeah, just to play uh, devil's advocate yeah. with you, uh, what, if I, like, what if I think about it and I'm like, Okay, I'm leaving this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will give me an opportunity and He will put me in the right positions. I'm leaving this one co-op position that I had and it was so beautiful and it had so many, so much money. They were paying me so much and it would be so beneficial for my career. But I left them because they just deal with riba. So I left this position for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I know that Allah will not forget what I did for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, how can I balance between the two views? Am I totally incorrect with what I'm, what I just, the example that I just gave you, or is there some truth to it? No, the the intention is the intention. So the, you're rewarded for your intention there, mm -hmm. and this is why, <clears throat> um, kind of going back to the idea of balance here, is that you have to balance what all of your roles that you're in. Okay. So you, as a student, may be able to pull this off. Me, as a professional with you know a family to take care of maybe I have other financial obligations you know to other people in my life if i know for a fact that me making the decision is going to have a clear dharr on everybody around me and i know that there is no possible opportunity for me to navigate around this then that would be a not a very smart decision right um so so this is this actually requires a little bit of calculation here right uh, when you're young, when you're single, you may be able to pull this off or you may be able to find another opportunity or there are uh, ways within the system to allow you to do that. However, as an adult, you have to plan your steps very accordingly, you know, to be able to do that. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that would be my answer. Allahu alam, you know, Allahu alam. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> at, at least, if you ask me right now at this stage, I, would, I wouldn't make a decision like that. Mm -hmm. right. See, someone had a question? Make, make up a question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about like, if you want to go somewhere like far away from your family, like just for something, like, for a career like, experience? Um, Sorry, I didn't get that. Like far, I far away, for like experience, you know it's a good experience with, with your part from your family. 
So I think he's asking yeah. about the ecology. Yeah, I, I think it's just less repeated. So, so yeah. So, so the question, so the question was, is it is it okay for me to go far away from my family in order to get uh, career experience? Uh, so there's a lot of hidden questions in there and assumptions in that. Uh, can I do it? Can I not do it? Uh, it it's, it's, it's a matter of opportunity, right? So if that's the only opportunity you have and you have a need to take that job because of, let's say you have loans, you have debts, you provide for someone else, uh, in that case, it may be permissible. Going away from your family is not haram. What's haram is cutting them off. Uh, what's haram is you know, being neglectful, uh, being harsh with them, right? That's what is haram. As for going away far from them, uh, that's totally permissible. I mean, if you ask me, <laughs> when I graduated, got on a plane 15, 15 days after my graduation, right? I went far, I went to a different country. Forget going from Waterloo to London or from, you know, ca you know Calgary or, you know, wherever else. I mean, I switched countries altogether. Uh, f I mean, you, that was for a career reason. Yes, also that was for religious reasons. Um, but also, uh, for me, what was, what was that? Once again, I'm seeking knowledge that's obligatory. So that takes precedence. Uh, also, for example, having certain final obligations because guess what? You go to university here, you've got some OSAP loans you gotta pay off as soon as possible before the interest kicks in. So forth and so forth, right? Um, so, it, so it really depends uh, what that means. But if you've got options here, right, and you're beside your parents' house, and you wanna go far away for the sake of it, I mean, stay close to them unless there's a reason to stay away from them. So I think there, there's, there needs to be more follow-up questions to be able to answer that more correctly, yeah. Well, let's say I had a job at like a gas station and one of the duties there was to like sell lottery tickets. Would that income not be halal? And if so, what should uh, I do with it? We're gonna get a fatwa out of you today. I know, we're gonna get a fatwa out of you today. <laughs> Let's repeat the question just for the sisters. He's asking if you work at a gas station, for example, is it halal for him to sell uh, lottery tickets? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> uh, uh, lot lottery transactions are invalid transactions, so it's not permissible for it's not, per, it's not permissible for you to engage in those uh, those transactions. Um, uh, is it permissible for you to work for a gas station? The answer is yes. Is it permissible for you to in engage in that specific action? No. Uh, you have to find a way to navigate it and get out of that situation by explaining to your boss that I don't, like I can't do that part of the job. You yeah, know? What about like, the income? Is that the income, income would be fine because you're being paid for not specifically just selling that, you're being paid for a whole range of activities. Mm -hmm. And what you assume is you're, you're being paid, this, just based on the example that I mentioned, is for all the permissible activities anyways, yeah. Okay. One more question. So like I'm studying accounting and finance, like me and a, yeah. like other brothers here, right? Yeah. And uh, we know like finance is a field with like a lot more money as compared to accounting. For sure. But do you think as like right now our second years, do you think it's better to just completely steer clear from a field like finance and stick to something more? Because like, accounting is paid based off like the accounting yeah. services you perform, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Question. So the question was, uh, second year finance student you are? Uh, accounting. Well, accounting, yeah, accounting slash finance student. Is it better, be, you know, because finance, uh, you know, there's a higher pay, there's more opportunities, uh, is it better to stay clear out of that and just do something more, I guess, safer than accounting? Did I get that correctly? Yeah. 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 Take and take accounting instead. Um, so, uh, the short answer is yes. The long answer would be I would stay in finance unless there's an opportunity in finance where two things. Once again, somehow you can avoid the financial instruments that are dubious. Or for example, I know some people that have intentionally stayed in finance because they want to pursue Islamic finance and they want to create a career out of that. Uh, whether it's through consulting or through use that opportunity and move somewhere to the Middle East. But you need to have a vision for why you're going to stay in finance. Right? Uh, if it's just for the sake of money, that's not a good intention. Uh, but if you find equally both accounting and finance, then I would go into accounting. Can you make more money accounting? You can make more money. You, you just have to figure out what the means of how you're going to do that. There's no reason to say, well, yeah, you build flock, yeah, you absolutely uh, finance, people in finance make more money. You could make more money, more money in accounting. Just start your own accounting firm and charge a lot and, you know, get tons of clients. I mean, I've seen that so many times from my friends, yeah, in mm -hmm. accounting, yeah. Uh, we have a lot of questions actually from the sisters uh, kind of saying the same thing. 
uh, which is uh, one specific sister is asking, she wants to be a doctor, but she's scared of free mixing and free mixing in general in the workplace. How, especially from a sister's perspective, how can she deal with that? How can she set boundaries at work? And yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, free mixing is, a, uh, I mean, I would argue that's, that's, a, that's a norm in, in Canadian society, and I would argue it's becoming a norm in other parts of the world. I mean, having lived in the Middle East, I mean, you see a lot of the changes. So people from opposite genders uh, are interacting with each other's, you know, whether it's at work, whether it's at school, whether it's just in normal society interactions. The, the important question, which the key word that you mentioned here is boundaries, right? What are the boundaries of the Sharia? So, first and foremost, it comes back down to really, really two things. Uh, uh, one is lowering your gaze, right? Uh, and lowering your gaze not just from a from an eye sense, but also from a from a shahwa sense. Is that as soon as you can sense yourself knowing that you know what I'm getting involved in a um, uh, in an interaction where there are feelings involved, then you have to stop that. Um, the other thing as well is also realizing that uh, formality, as awkward it may be, is going to be rewarding to you in the long in the long run. Okay, uh, so what I mean by that is you may think that you know what I need to joke a bit, I need to be a bit more light. Let me go ahead and tell me tell tell this person about my feelings and the blast that I had with my friends or you know the, the problems that I'm having with my parents. You'll realize that in the long run, especially in career related relationships, none of those will benefit you, right? None of those will benefit you. That person, they will not understand, they will not benefit you. Uh, and also it will just lead to, uh, lead to more harm. Uh, so setting those boundaries, like I said, being extremely formal uh, or being formal, right? You can still be polite, you can still be considered, you can say, hello, how is your you know, weekend? Or you know, how's it going? All these things are fine. I mean, I do it all the time. Um, but as for saying like, hey, let me tell you what I did this last weekend, or you know, hey, why don't you tell me what you, you know, what do you like doing for, for entertainment? Those questions have no, no reason to be there, right? Um, but I wouldn't not pursue a career because of free mixing, because I'll be honest with you, I think every job has that now, right? Uh, unless you maybe work at an all girls school or something like that. But even in Canada now, all girls schools. You can have people that identify as women now working at them. Now you're screwed, so you can't do it. <laughs> so, you're not, so you're stuck now. So you're stuck back again, right? Um, but yeah, it's about setting brownies, setting lower gaze. It's about, uh, once again, keeping yourself formal. And most importantly, just catching yourself. As soon as you sense something, feel something, stop it, cut it off, and don't worry about it. Forget hurt feelings. They're, when they go to sleep at night, they're not thinking about you, right? <laughs> uh, just one more question yeah. for our sister, uh, asking about traveling alone without a mahram. Oh yeah. And for the sake of uh, getting a good job opportunity, or like she has a, like a, she got a good job offer that she has to travel to without a mahram. Yeah, look, the family that they are they are you know, some other uh, scholars allow it, some scholars are not. Even for something as obligatory as seeking sacred knowledge, some other scholars have it. Um, whereas um, others have not. Um, so yeah, you'll you'll have to speak to a scholar and explain your situation to them, and they'll be able to give you a fatwa accordingly. Um, yeah. So, brother, uh, in terms of like. I guess, how should, the, um, how should we approach um, how can we become good representatives of this event in the workplace? What kind of strategies or behaviors or specific actions should we try to take in order to create a good image of Islam and possibly invite people to learn more about Islam uh, at our workplaces? Brother is asking, uh, how can you reflect the identity of a Muslim in your workplace? Yeah, this is, yeah, subhanAllah, yeah, extremely important. So. Um, when you go out in the corporate world, um, there are two basically uh, scenarios and contexts where, th where this will come out. The first context will be Ramadan. Okay, when Ramadan comes into play, or even I guess maybe there's a third context, but particularly Ramadan, when that comes into place, everybody will know you're fasting, right? Everyone will know you're fasting, right? They may talk about it, 
uh, situations will come up where you have to say, oh, sorry, I'm fasting, or sorry, I don't need to pray, or sorry, I was up late, late, late last night, or whatever, right? Or maybe even Eid, let's say. Now, that, that will tell people that you are Muslim. That's one thing, okay? And some people will have questions. I get questions all the time, right? So even in the last couple of corporate roles I've had, you know, fasting people ask questions. So I'm just curious. So like, are you allowed? Let's see, you know, are you allowed to have water? Right? Are you allowed to have water? Like, how long is the fast? You know? Uh, or it's interesting. The common question I get quite a bit is like, um, do kids have to fast? Right? Uh, do women? You know, what if a what if a woman's pregnant? Does she have to fast? So those questions come up, right? Especially if you vocally say you know you're fasting, those those questions will come up. So that will open the door to Islam. As for the question of being representatives of Islam, that will come out in your work ethic, especially after they've learned the fact that you're Muslim, right? And I cannot stress this more than enough, right? Uh, is for example, even small things, right? You haven't done this, but once you go into your corporate world, does this person? start their meetings on time, whether it's on Zoom, whether it's in person. Do they come to meetings on time? Uh, do they take notes? Do they finish their deadlines, right? Uh, how do they interact with other team members? Do they have an interest in them, right? Uh, do they take part in, you know, uh, activities, right? Uh, to show that, you know, they care for the business. When they see those things, they have a good opinion. Uh, they have a good opinion in Islam. And right now, I'll tell you right now, I'm, you know, Sorry, I mean, this is stereotype. We're stereotyping right now, but this is a reality right now. Why is there, I mean, there's such a bad reputation of, especially here in Kitchener Waterloo, uh, towards our unfortunate friends uh, that come and study Conestoga College. Why? It's not so much of the fact of, uh, of, of how they're uh, performing academically. It's like, oh, and I'll tell you, because I've taught at Conestoga College, you have signs within the college that says, guys, please do not wash your dishes inside the water fountain. Who washes dishes in a water fountain? Guys, please don't spill your curry down the drain. Now, guess what? Who they attribute it to? Now they're going to attribute it to, you know, uh, immigrants coming out of India. So now they have a bad image because of that. Now, if they were known for their cleanliness, if they were known for other things, their professionalism or other things, then when they would say, you know, mashallah, these Indians, they came from, you know, they're sitting in Conestoga and they've made such a huge impact in society or in their education and so forth. All these things matter, right? And I notice these things. I can tell you the difference between students that come out of Nigeria versus uh, uh, Ghana versus, you know, Punjab versus South India versus North India. All those students are different. And there's certain stereotypes that build based on their interactions. And the same thing with Muslims, right? What are Muslims known for? They may say, oh, he doesn't come out to, you know, the happy hour. But man, when they give presentations or when they hold meetings, flawless, amazing. I take that any day over it you know, party Joe who may have a great time at the happy hour, but man, he comes late to all the meetings. So these, these things matter. These things matter and they go a long way. You might say, oh, it's just a small thing. They go a long way in your career. Yeah. You got a question? Huh? Oh, yeah. So you mentioned that, like, so someone working at a community? <laughs> <laughs> they, all, 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 they all come back to these questions, you know, <laughs> eventually. Someone working at a community says, like, like let's say if like an engineer were to have a job that's like way more direct. Like, if he was working for like the defense, right? And like they told him to make a bomb. That's kind of like a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, once again, this is a pure fatwa question. Um, but as far as I as I have heard, um, if you're working for a defense company that you know is dropping bombs on Muslim countries, uh, that's that's beyond haram, I mean. That's, uh. <laughs> if, I, if I try to generalize the, well, both questions we had, yeah. actually, uh, a lot of us tend to get laid back on the, it's also a big haram question yeah. that you're dealing with. You might have like all your risk, all your income yeah. become haram because of what you do. Yeah. Uh, if you're careless or if you say this is just an opportunity yeah. for me to grow and then you neglect getting out of this position uh, year after year, year after year, and then you end up having like all your income being haram, all the clothes that you wear yeah. are all co coming from haram money. So can you talk about like also the dangers of that and how, how much we should be scared of it or how much we should be aware that, uh, that it's a thing? Yeah. Mm. So I think you brought up a good point and it reminded me of something. Uh, and it's funny, I, I've mentioned this in, 
You know, one of my khutbahs on, on dua, one of the adab of dua, or how do you know your dua is mustajab? And one of them is what? Is that you have risk that is halal, right? Uh, and we have the hadith, right? وَمَطْعَمُهُ حَرَامُ وَمَلْبَسُهُ حَرَامُ Right? فَأَنَّ يُسْتَجَابَ لَهُ His, you know, his clothes are haram, you know, and his ta'am, his food is haram, and his drink is haram. How is, dua, how is his dua to be accepted? Uh, and definitely a big part of that is career choices, right? Working for defense or working as a lottery seller or working at the LCBO. So that's one, that's one aspect of what would make your income haram. There's other aspects of things that would make your income haram that we don't consider. Like what? If you work a contract job, yeah, I'm working 40 hours a week. Guess what? You've practically only worked 20 hours a week, which means what? Which means the other remaining 20 hours of your income that you've clocked in is what? It's haram. Or you have some sort of work that you're supposed to do. You didn't do it. You got someone else to do the job, right? Uh, you hired someone else or you copied and pasted or you plagiarized or something like that. Uh, or you cheated or you cut corners. You know, you slapped your logo on it or someone else and you submitted it as your own. Guess what? That's also haram, right? So the question of what what's going to make your income haram, for sure your income, your career choice is one of them, but also how do you conduct yourself in, in, in those job opportunities, right? You're being paid for a certain set of responsibilities. All of those responsibilities, guess what? Are wajib on you. I would say wajib shar'an because that's how you get your income. For you to neglect them, right? you are entering into sin. That means that some aspect of your portion, if you could keep persisting in them, right, will become haram, right? So don't just look at it and look, okay, you know, mashallah, alhamdulillah, I've got the most halal job ever, right? I'm at a grocery store selling fruits and vegetables, all being sourced from Palestine, alhamdulillah. But guess what? I come to work five hours late. I'm the first, I'm the last one to clock in. I'm the first one to clock out. Right? And I'm sitting there on my phone the whole time playing. I'm getting someone else to do all the cashier work, organizing all the fruits and vegetables. Guess what? Your income is, yani, the job is halal, but your income is haram. You haven't done any work. Right? You're being sinful there. Right? So keep, keep, that, keep that question, keep that aspect of, of your job and income being halal and haram uh, in there as well. Or, or I don't know if you want to monitor. Yeah. I don't know. Who is my... uh, let, Let's take care. Yeah, because you have it. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, moving to the Middle East. Uh, Asking yeah, for the Sheikh's advice on moving to the Middle East for a job opportunity. Yeah. Is it just job opportunity or just in general kind of moving there? Um, you have to, so there's two things. Uh, one is whatever you, whatever is here can also be found in the Middle East. The lifestyle over here that you're trying to avoid it is very easily to recreate that in the Middle East. So that's a very important point here. So don't think that by moving there, all your problems will go away. So having that niya is very important. Um, the second thing is the opportunity has to be there. So if the opportunity doesn't exist, one doesn't force oneself there. However, however, everything being equal, everything being equal, I would consider moving for to the Middle East for a few reasons. Uh, and if these reasons or these conditions don't exist, I wouldn't do it. So first and foremost, if you're going to move to the Middle East, and you're not going to learn Arabic, you're wasting your time. If you're going to move to the Middle East and you're not intentionally going to give your family an Islamic lifestyle, meaning that, for example, when I was in Jordan, every salah was in the masjid. Over here, yani Fajr, Isha, yani we're trying. We're barely just trying here. right? It's just so hard because of jobs and whatnot. You need to be able to recreate that. The third thing is... And I don't know about you guys. You have to go there with the intention of emulating and understanding what is.
East for different ways. And, you know, and I've traveled all across the Middle East. And even I would recommend go to Turkey, go to Malaysia, go to other parts of the world. Do you realize how Islam is being represented, how people are living Islam? Two things happen. You get confident in your identity as a Muslim because you're like, oh my God, there's a gazillion of us. So that's one thing. So you feel like, you know what? Being in Canada or being in the US, I feel like such a person that I'm, I feel like I'm in a corner the whole time. I'm like struggling. I'm trying to fight between fighting against a, another culture. You don't feel like that anymore. But the second thing is, you also learn that, you know what? Islam can be lived in different ways. and the ways you entertain yourselves it's not just like khalas, it's either this or that right uh, and I think that's been the most fruitful thing for me now uh, you know and, and to be able to give that to your family and to your But if you're just going to close your eyes and just jump into the Middle East, the chances of you recreating everything you've done here over there are, are very probably high. And I've seen that from people as well. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take a question from the sisters first. Uh, our sister is asking, how important is it for her to be career driven, knowing that earning is not the main priority for a woman and knowing that her main priority is... We're kind of falling back on a question that was yeah. asked before, but it's mostly talking about uh, how earning is should not be her priority. So should be should she be more career driven or should she like not focus on career as much? Um, you should be, whether you're a man or woman, you should be God driven. <laughs> um, and like I said, uh, it may mean, it may mean depending on your circumstances uh, as a sister, that may mean that career has a very important aspect of your life at a certain phase, but it may not at another phase uh, of your life. And once again, this can apply to men as well, right? Career is the most important thing. I would argue from the age, especially as a, as a, as a you can, no, same thing, you could apply for both men and women. But I would say between the ages of, let's say, 20 to 30, 35, get really good at your career. Become an expert, become a leader. Right? Get yourself financially independent. Feel like if the economy goes up and down, you lose your job, you can find another job or you can start your own game, you can start your own company and do your own thing. Why? Because in the 10, 15, 20 years after that, like I said, you focus on your family. And like I said, with every sister, I don't know. There's circumstances here, right? Um, my job. So the question is not like, oh, let me not care about my career. Keep that in mind. I, I know situations, for example, sisters, they had to focus on their career because father, mother, really old age, they had to take care of them, no one to support them. Guess what? She has to get a job. What are you going to say? Don't be career driven. You, you have to be career driven, right? Uh, husband becomes disabled. What are you going to do? She has to be the earner, right? Uh, you know, less of Allah, anything happens, you know, within, let's say, even the marriage or the kids, she has to go back to work. Okay. Does she have some skill set? Does she have anything to that she can fall back on, right? Um, so, so, there, yeah. So, 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 be God driven first, but uh, as the Prophet said, you know, be out for that which benefits you, right? Yeah. And what benefits each and every single one of us is, is different, right? Uh, I wouldn't tell a guy to be career driven at the expense of their deen or for their family or for the community as well, you know, mm -hmm. be career driven for it, for the deen, but not at the expense of it. And same thing with sister as well. If you want to be driven, do it. For the sake of it, you know, um, yeah. So uh, we also have one more question about the uh, legal careers in Canada. Uh, should we stay away from them? Do you have any idea on? Uh, do you have any opinions on legal careers here in Canada or any like Western country? What do you mean by legal? Like in in, in like law? Law, yeah. No. Or it's... no clue. No clue. <laughs> no clue. Sorry. Okay, brother, here had that question. Yeah. <laughs> So he's asking about insurance and Islam and it's halal and haram and 
what kind of event? Uh, I mean, if you're obligated by the state to take insurance, then you, you have to take insurance. You cannot uh, avoid it. Uh, however, for you to go after something like life insurance, actually now they have insurance for everything. Now you get insurance on your insurance on your insurance on your insurance. Uh, talking more about uh, career wait. insurance, I think. Oh, career sorry. insurance. Oh, working yeah. insurance. Uh, yeah, avoid it altogether. I would, I would avoid it altogether. Um, I don't, yeah. That's, yeah, that's my personal opinion. Um, yeah. Allah Allah knows best. You had a question? Yes. Wait, 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 wait. You work your, you work your job? Yeah, you finish, like, Nine to, four. yeah. And you finish uh, the morning. And you don't do anything the rest, for the rest of the day. So is that Oh, at your job? Have? Yeah. Oh, I mean. <laughs> I think you were talking more about contract jobs, right? Yeah. yeah, so it depends on the nature of your job, right? If your job is such that, like, hey, you finished, you know, I've, you know, you work nine to five. So, for example, I work at Dairy Queen. So, guys, I know how to make ice cream. I know how to make ice cream cakes, okay? Um, in the winter months, guess what? Dead. Who's going to buy ice cream in the winter? So they used to make us say, okay, like, let's make some ice cream cakes because maybe someone would want them. Sometimes we would just literally sit around do nothing. Just wait for people to come through. Am I doing something haram? No, there's, there's just no work to do, right? Um, but if there is work to be done and you're not doing it, that's where it becomes problematic. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, in your context, like I said, you finish all the work, there's nothing to do, then it's nothing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's asking uh, when you have free time at your work and you're still on the, you're still technically working, can you do any personal work? Yeah. So, you know, that's actually a question for an employer. So some employers will not allow you to do any work uh, outside of uh, outside of your your work, even if you're even if there's nothing to do. So that's really a question for them. If they said, "Yeah, sure, go for it," then do it. If they say, "No, I'm sorry, no," then you can't. Yeah. Time for one more question. Anyone has a question? A lot of fake questions. Not a good one. <laughs> okay. If there's no questions, then uh, no, we had a recommendation. To, for you to give us some dua that we can do for our careers and for us to be safe in the path we choose for ourselves. I'm just going to add a any... little bit to that. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can just give us a little bit of final parting advice on like, mm -hmm. as people who are, who are just getting started with our career, do you have anything we should really like be going, cranking up to level 11 right now to ensure that we, we kind of set ourselves up for success going forward? <laughs> no, you didn't stump me. You didn't stump me. I mean, the 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 words are uh, running through my through my heart right now, uh, and and maybe this is advice to myself. Um, when you're planning your when you're planning or when you're thinking about your career, have the have have a vision. Ha, have a vision for the deen right in front of you. Have a vision for the deen right in front of you. And pay attention to the fact that I didn't say have a vision for yourself or for your life in front of you. Two very distinct things here. When you have a vision for the deen in front of you, or let's you can even say the ummah in front of you, you start to understand where you, what part you have to play in this larger picture of life. Okay? This larger uh, setup that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put up there, right? And that is going to inform the decisions you're going to make in terms of, like I said, how you want to benefit the community, right? Some of you, once again, you're maybe tech entrepreneurs. That's the direction you want to go. Some of you have visions when it comes to finances. Some of you have business. Some of you have religious visions. Some of you have uh, visions of some philanthropy work. Maybe it's any of some of those combinations. 
And when you have that vision in mind, it becomes very much easier to work backwards and see how you're going to recreate that life, right? So it's going <clears> to <throat> answer two things for you. It's going to answer, what should I do, right? And the second most important is, what kind of person do I need to become in order to actualize that vision? What kind of person do I need to become in order to actualize that? That means you have to be responsible, on time. You have to be someone who has certain skill sets. It needs to be someone who knows how to navigate life, people, societies, polities, organizations. It also means other things as well. It means what are certain traits of the hearts you need to have. That means that I have a certain level of sincerity. I need to have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need to have certainty. I need to have humility. I need to have a good opinion. Husn al The things that destroys Muslim ummah is the what, what's the thing that destroys Muslim ummah? is su al It's not that, oh, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. The fact that you have su al is the fact that you think that. Right? You would have never thought that about Tom, Dick, and Derry, Jerry or whatever. But you think that about your ummah. Or you're right about the, the Muslimin. And so who is who is it that you need to become? And so having a vision for the deen will answer the question of what you need to do and who you need to become. And inshallah ta'ala that is going to spark the fire that you need in order to excel. And I, I'll tell you right now, that first year at York University, C's and D's, joining the MSA and getting a vision for, for my life, a student right after that. Why? There was a vision there. There was something that was driving me. Outside of that, there was nothing there. There was nothing motivating me. Even though job and career was there, it, was, it wasn't strong enough to pull me through that. So um, anyways, but yeah. Inshallah. Um, Alhamdulillah, we're going to end on this. Thank you so much for... <clears throat> for yeah, do some du'as du for us? Or make du'as for us? Specific <laughs> du'as, yani. uh, I think one of the most important du'as, and you may say I already know this du'a, but this du'a has a direct link when it comes to the, even the question of career and deen and dunya, which is what? Which is, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا فِي الدُّنْيَا what? Hasana, right? So Allah, please give us in our careers, hasana. Oh Allah, please give us in our marriages, hasana. Oh Allah, please give in our education, hasana. Oh Allah, when I go to the gym, give me hasana. Oh Allah, when I get involved in the politics or organization, give me hasana. Wa fil akhirati hasana. Right? Wa qina adhab al-nar. Right? So I think this is the, the most important dua. Yeah, you can make dua, or, you know, Rabbi zidni ilma, oh Allah, give me knowledge. Oh Allah, may asaluka rizqan tayyib. And oh Allah, please give me this that is tayyib. All those du'as that we make, but this du'a is, is jamma for a reason, is because, and when we make this du'a, keep that in mind. That this job that I'm applying for, give me in it hasana. The school, that a course that I'm in, the program then, give me hasana. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, give everything in it hasana. Inshallah, we'll make some short du'a and then we'll, we'll, we'll end here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, waftar al-salatu wa khmat al-salim, ala Sayyidina Muhammad. وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم اسمعنا خير ما طلعنا خير ما زكنا اللهم عافية ودم لنا وجمع اللهم قلوبنا على بري وتقوى لما تحب وترضى ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا وقطعنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين آمين. اللهم هبب إلينا الإيمان آمين. وزينه في قلوبنا آمين. وكره إلينا الكفر والفسوق والأسيان واجعلنا من الراشدين آمين. اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا واعفنا واعف عنا اللهم اغفر لنا ولوالدينا ومشائخنا وأولادنا اللهم احفظ أولادنا وبناتنا وشبابنا من الفتن ما ظهر منها وما بطن آمين. اللهم انصر إخواننا في فلسطين آمين. اللهم انصر إخواننا في فلسطين آمين. اللهم انصر إخواننا في فلسطين آمين. اللهم حرر المسجد الأقصى من اليهود الغاصبين آمين. اللهم شتت شملهم ومزق جمعهم وخالف بين كلمتهم وزلزل إقدامهم يا قوي يا عزيز آمين. اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وجزاكم الله خير Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the talk. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, too many more with you. It was amazing. We've had so many questions, many more than usual, actually. Alhamdulillah.